there are real dangers to being uh, be, being enticed by this warm notion that we don't have to make dramatic changes and and face them and think through you know their uh, th- their full sort of force and we can just leave it to gradualism and you know uh, one day it will sort itself out well that's not happened has it in the last 20 years of devolution Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and I shall be talking today with um, David Melding, a member of the um, uh, the trustees of the Federal Trust, who will be talking to us about constitutional issues and particularly uh, the territorial aspect of these constitutional issues. David is well qualified to discuss these issues. He was for more than 20 years a, a member of the Welsh Parliament, a Conservative member of the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, and he's written extensively on constitutional issues uh, and broadcasts on them as well. So, David, thank you very much for joining us. Um, first question, um, will King Charles III be inheriting a, a disunited kingdom? Well, I think unquestionably he does inherit a disunited uh, kingdom. And uh, although it's a biblical lifetime ago, uh, to his mother's coronation, 1953. But just think how the United Kingdom appeared then with no uh, possibility of any discussion, really, of Scottish secession. Uh, the, the Irish troubles had not started at that stage, though the the, the problems were there under the surface, certainly. Um, and Wales and England seemed to be uh, in a, a a relationship that was very deep and didn't allow for very different political expression. And that's just completely changed. Uh, it's it's quite remarkable, really, the extent of, of the change. And uh, I suppose our challenge is to think, is, is that change so you know, radically different to, to what went before that we're, we're not really going to be able to cope with it? Or are there things in our tradition which, you know, perhaps should have warned us that these sort of possibilities are always there, and uh, now they are, you know, playing out in full force. Do you think that the de- devolution process has um, encouraged or, or reduced, mitigated this um, this process of growing disunity? I think that without the devolution reforms of the late 1990s, the situation would be in much, much worse than we can really find ourselves in. Um, so I, I think devolution was a necessary reform, but it's not been uh, sufficient. And a lot of the problems with it, really, that that, that haven't uh, really led to a firm constitutional settlement is because... Uh, we, we, we went on with this sort of uh, Victorian invention of home rule, which is kind of federalism without um, uh, dividing sovereignty. And if you don't really address sovereignty issues quite clearly in fundamental constitutional change, and I think you you, you do open up uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of difficulties. And that's what we've seen... Uh, work out and and one thing i think that uh, the, the labor party's uh, uh you know enthusiasts for devolution got wrong was that somehow it would lead to uh the, the nationalist parties in in scotland and wales uh being much weaker because uh, people would just settle for devolution and not see much purpose uh in in voting for nationalist parties and um, you would just have the sort of uh a, it's standard partisan uh, um, splits uh, that 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 you you at one time had uh, in the United Kingdom. Certainly, when the Queen was coronated, uh, then uh, uh, that that somehow would then just sort of reassert itself in in Scotland and Wales. And we obviously know that that did not happen at all. And uh, in the very first election, Plaid Cymru uh, had a breakthrough. They've not been able to build on that. The SNP didn't do very well in 1999, but uh, eight years later, they were the largest party, and we know what's happened since. Uh, obviously, um, there, there are different problems and different tensions in different parts of the United Kingdom, and that may be one of the, the problems about finding an overall formula. Uh, but, but you 
advocate in the excellent paper you've written for the Federal Trust, uh, a federal system for the United Kingdom. Um, how, how do you think that would mitigate the sort of problems that you've been pointing to? Well, I, I think its key advantage is, is that it sets out a, a clear way of dividing sovereignty. So the uh, the political institutions uh, in the United Kingdom, both those in Scotland and Wales and in the United Kingdom and possibly in England at some stage, they all have uh, permanence and uh, they are unalterable unless those institutions themselves uh, decide to uh, uh, reform or abolish themselves. Uh, it's a very unlikely prospect. But um, so there's a firm settlement. And then around that, you have a better basis for intergovernmental relations and also a way of dealing, should there be a question then of part of the United Kingdom wanting to secede. Uh, in a federal constitution, you would presumably, uh, um, in the British case, you, you would have a clause that you know dealt with that and, and set up a clear process should that ever be a, um, um, you know, a, a desire of a significant part of uh, uh, the population. Um, and, and really, you have a sort of rule book to deal with territorial politics. That's the, in a nutshell, the great advantage of federalism. Whereas devolution, is, it's not completely unwritten. Uh, 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 and that's the case of the British Constitution. People sometimes just term it as unwritten. But it, it's messy, spotty. It's in a constellation of um, statutes. So it doesn't have a sort of very... Uh, uh, so coherent identity, and and that when you're dealing with profound territorial disputes such as secession, is really a formula for a, a very poor outcome, which you know possibly could be damaging to both sides in in that particular question. And are you sustained in that view by the experience of the two great constitutional referendums that we've had over the past 10 years, the Scottish independence referendum and um, and the Brexit referendum. I'm thinking not so much of the outcomes, which you might or might not uh, approve of, as uh, as the way in which they they took place and the preparation for them and the um, the idea that winner would take all, one white vote would suffice. Um, do, do you think that um, that was uh, an undesirable um, development over the past few years, which um, federalism would, would, would have an important role in, in, in abolishing, essentially. Yes, I, I mean, it would be possible in in non-federal constitutions to have a good uh, referendum uh, uh, procedure, right? So, so, but federalism, I do think, uh, helps. Uh, I mean, I think the 2010s on constitutional issues was a very disappointing decade. Um, and I, I suppose, really, the, 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 if you look at David Cameron um, and his thinking, um, or at least what you know, we can conjecture about by his, his thinking, um, the, the the referendum in Scotland, I, I think he thought would be, you know, decisively won by the Unionist side. Now it was won decisively uh, <clears throat> by ten percent margin. Um, after a you know a real scare halfway through that campaign, when um, I think unionists thought it was quite possible they were going to lose, but uh, certainly David Cameron um, and uh, the, the the leading members of of that government thought uh, in conceding a referendum uh, on Scottish independence that that would put pressure really on the SNP and may. Uh, you know, lead to such a, a clear result that uh, it would weaken the SNP's uh, um, um, political position. Well, that was a complete misreading. I mean, to have 45% of the uh, voting public in Scotland backing um, secession, I think, was a real shock. But um, I don't think David Cameron, you know, learned that lesson, really. You know, he we heard that the 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 the, the that the Queen was delighted with the result and uh, uh, purring uh, down the telephone, and, and purring down the telephone. That's right. Um, and then uh, having, with the other uh, political leaders in the UK, ha having gone up to Scotland and promised that if you voted no to independence, you you would get a new sort of 
de super devolved or Devo Max state, uh, the, 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 as the jargon had it then, uh, and then there would be a, you know a, a, a fresh uh, uh, um, idea of, of of the union delivered, uh, uh, and that just didn't happen. In fact, the, the day after the result, um, he stood on the steps of Downing Street and said, "You know, the real problem now to sort out was English governance, which, you know, I think he was right that." English governance has to be uh, looked at, uh, but to have raised it at that point, I think was is a great mistake. And then I think it, the similar a similar sort of um, uh, 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 sort of delusion gripped him in in, in the Brexit referendum. I I, I I think you know that was promised um, on the basis that uh, it 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 was pretty sh that, that he was pretty sure anyway that the outcome would be uh, a bit like the seventy five referendum. Which was two thirds in, in favour of remaining in the uh, EEC as it, it then was, um, and of course that was a te you know absolutely catastrophic misreading of the question. But I think in both referendums, what you didn't have is the 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 the, the referendum that so brutal one day uh, uh, result of a plebiscite of people who want to be slightly sceptical. of the whole process, um, it, you know, is detached from wider thinking uh, about what the consequences are and, you know, what the new situation would be um, after the result. And so I think that's where we've been weak. So I, I would much prefer to see use of referenda uh, being preceded by some sort of citizen involvement uh, in, in the process. And then the result of the referendum, you know, going into parliament for further discussion and perhaps a double vote in a referendum. So you'd have initial vote to open the gateway to possibilities. And then after the parliamentary deliberation, you would have the, you know, clear um, proposition and 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 the decisive vote then at that stage, um, the possibility that, that I think would be much more a much more constitutional way of proceeding. Yes, you you talked about the um, the spotty and the inco inconsistent nature of British constitutional thinking. Isn't there a school of thought that thinks that's a, a rather attractive aspect about the way the British uh, approach constitutional questions, that they they eschew, uh, if you like, um, systematic constitutional thinking because they regard it as a, as a, a, as the royal road, as the devil's road, if you like, to, to inflexibility. But what I'm really wondering is whether the British political system can envisage as, as coherent a, a system as Fed Federalism, given that there's a lot in the constitutional tradition of the United Kingdom, which is meant to be improvised and incrementalist and, uh, and not um, conforming to, to, to models, but um, just solve, solving problems as they come up. Um, is it politically practical without the reversal of war or a, an epidemic or whatever it might be to envisage the British system and adopting the sort of thoroughgoing federalism you're talking about? Well, I, I mean, I think there is some uh, um, sort of power to be uh, gained from uh, uh, organic change. And I think, how, you know, these things can run in parallel. You can have organic change and then also on some fundamental issues, you know, quite rapid change. Um, and, you know, certainly if you look at the British constitutional, um, sort of, or if you look at British constitutional history, um, you know, there have been some pretty dramatic developments that weren't at all organic, really. I mean, they had antecedents in, you know, previous events and outcomes and all the rest of it. But I mean, I, I, I think if you look at, uh, um, you, you know, parliamentary sovereignty being established in the 1690s, that was a, you know, quite an emphatic way to end the uh, the turbulence of the 17th century. Uh, the 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 you know transfer of power from king to uh, uh, prime minister right that was pretty gradual but the arrival of democracy in in the 1830s um, it was partial at first but you know the uh, the logic of it was at that point established I think you know that was a huge change and was bitterly opposed by you know many in in uh, um, in, in in the state um, similarly female suffrage. Um, the supremacy of the House of Commons over, over the House of Lords. I mean, and, and that was embroiled in the Home Rule uh, question as well. 
But it was, you know, it was absolutely fought tooth and nail. There was nothing organic about it unless spilling metaphoric blood can be taken as being, uh, um, you know, organic. So I, you know, I, I, I think we can sometimes be we can some reason to into jump. thinking that, oh, you know, the British tradition is gradualism. And, you know, there's been some of that, no doubt. But, I mean, there's been an awful lot of... Um, dramatic change, abrupt change even, and, and more or less for uh, the better. And I think one of the key indications of where it's not worked has it, it, been on, because we didn't divide sovereignty uh, and instead in the 1990s and instead went with devolution and, you know, Westminster retaining all sovereignty, at, at least notionally, um, we, 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 we then slid into uh, um a, a Scottish refer uh, referendum on independence. Now, if you have a, uh, an in independence referendum in part of your state, it, is that not a most radical division of sovereignty? I mean, uh, what, what other basis can you justify allowing part of your state to secede? So, you know, it, it, there are real dangers to being... Uh, um, being enticed by this warm notion that we don't have to make dramatic changes and and face them and think through you know their uh, their, their full sort of force and we can just leave it to gradualism and you know uh, one day it will sort itself out well that's not happened has it in the last 20 years of devolution well, on the day after the scottish uh, referendum i was in italy and a number of italian colleagues who, who were but unionists, if you if you will, at a distance, congratulated me on what they thought was the sagacity of the English voters in the way they decided in the referendum. <laughs> I could explain to them, of course, that no single English person had voted in that referendum, yeah. which is which is an anomaly um, brought out by what you just said there. Oh yes, I, I think the uh, the. <laughs> If you look at the Canadian experience, where obviously they've also had uh, experience of uh, a secession referendum, which was sanctioned by the state, but it it wasn't done in, in the, the the way uh, that the, uh, the, the UK government granted uh, the people of Scotland the, uh, the a referendum in in twenty fourteen. I mean, there um, it was much more about. Uh, uh, um, a future relationship and uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, you know, then made clear that uh, if there was a, a, a referendum in Quebec that that supported secession, that would open up the process to negotiation and pro perhaps reformulating the state in some way, because you'd have to do that because all the citizens of Canada should be involved as well as the citizens of Quebec, I don't think it's a veto on secession. If that ultimately, it you know is is the only way forward, but it is a way of trying to really get people to think. Well, how can we manage to stay together at some level, even though we have this demand for more and more autonomy? Would your conception of a federal state involve reviewing some other? controversial issues such as the existence of the House of Lords, proportional representation, resource allocation to um, uh, to, to, to non-central levels of government? Would that be part of the package? Yes, and I, I think, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, a more gradual approach to, uh, um, to some of these questions. I mean, why on earth, after, you know, uh, getting on for 25 years of devolution now, why have we not reformed the House of Lords to at least in part be a territorial chamber? Mm. I mean, it's astonishing that that opportunity has not been taken. If you look at the union from its start in 1707, it was principally a parliamentary union. And from that, the, you know, the whole British wider identity was, was built very slow in the 18th century, much faster in the 19th. Uh, 19th. And then, you know, through Mid to mid 20th century, very strong force. So why don't we take the parliamentary tradition and you know reform uh, one of the chambers of of Westminster? It, it would just be you know, you know such a positive thing to do and one that could really strengthen the union. So I think that would be very very welcome. If you look at um, the electoral system, I think there are, there's, there's a wider sort of uh, uh, argument here for for reform, and um, 
we you know we have some very odd results now because of our first past the post system in in, in essence the first past the post system is designed for a two party system and it's a long time since the uk was that and uh, uh I, you know i do think that nettle has to be grasped fairly soon. It should be said that if we move to proportional representation, you'd have some form of, you know, coalition government uh, more often than not. And that itself would strengthen the territorial integrity of the uh, United Kingdom because, you, you, you know, you, it, it, it would be much, much less likely that Scotland or Wales would be consistently voting um, against the UK government or, uh, the, 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 you know, that that, that was in power. Um, and, and and so I think that would help as well. So I, 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 I do think electoral reform could be part of the package, though, again, it, it you know, obviously, it, it, if you have federalism, you could still have a f first past the post electoral system. Uh, but I think in our case, we would be wise to look at uh, proportional representation. Uh, implicit in what you're saying, and I think perhaps more explicit in the paper, uh, is that, that a federal system would provide a, a better basis for maintaining the integrity of the United Kingdom. Not necessarily a foolproof basis, but a, a better basis. Do you have any general view about the desirability or otherwise of um, of nationalism in multinational states, there is a view which says that um, nationalism in multinational states is is almost invariably a, a positive development. That uh, if Spain becomes four or five um, nation states, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you you perhaps don't share that view. Well, I, I you know I I think the um, developments of the last thirty years that have seen the sort of political. Um, identity of Scotland and and Wales, um, you know, strengthen and uh, these, you know, the the the, the, Sc the the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Parliament have real authority and you know a rootedness now in their respective uh, um, countries. So I, I and I, if you look at the United Kingdom as as this incredible family of nations, the home nations as we sometimes call it. I mean, they do have very deep traditions and uh, have brought great richness and have you know, all contributed to the, uh, uh, you know, to our political achievements through 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 the decades. So, um, I, you know, I am a a, a lowercase n nationalist in that sense. Mountain. I, I, I don't think there's you know any uh, you know any problem recognizing uh, you know, a political dimension to nationalism. I mean. You know, traditionally in Wales, it's been much more of a cultural force. So that's changed a lot recently. Um, and I, you know, I don't think it needs to stay at that level at all. And uh, and you mentioned, you know, the the, the Spanish case. I, I don't know an awful lot about Spanish politics, but I mean, obviously, they've gone down that route of recognizing diversity. Um, the question is whether nationalism, you know, as an ideal, takes you firmly towards. Statehood should nations be states unless you know there's a very good reason for them not to be, and I that's not a proposition I agree with. I think you know nations are often states, and no doubt at times nations should become states, but I think nations can abide in a multinational state um, with um, and flourish. I mean, I I I, I do not see this as. Uh, you know, uh, only one of these directions is is the right one. So, uh, so that's my position there. I I do think that we get a very insular view of all this in the United Kingdom. The Scottish referendum, I mean, it, it didn't really think about the international dimension very much. I mean, Catalonia came into the question, and would the Spanish government veto uh, Scotland's membership of the EU? And you know, the whole EU question it's, it's another matter which would be worthy of a separate discussion. But, it, you know, it was very much an afterthought. It, the, 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 what would Scottish secession have, have, have done internationally? What would, as political philosophers quaintly put it, what would have been the demonstration effects? Well, I think the breakup of Britain would have sent, you know, quite a powerful message to many other national groups around the world that, you know, perhaps they should break up their multinational state. 
Now, we may be relaxed about that, but I think we should acknowledge that could be an, a, you know, a consequence. And we didn't do that. And nor did, you know, in the Scottish referendum, did we really think about what would happen in Northern Ireland or what would happen in Wales if Scotland became independent. So, you know, it was quite, and that affects unionists and nationalists. It's, I'm not, I'm not condemning the nationalist uh, uh, position, uh, 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 and, 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 you know, specifically, I think this affected both unionist and nationalist uh, arguments. Right. And, um, you know, know, if nations are going to be states, I will, sorry uh, uh, to, to labour this point, Brendan, but if, if we're going to have many, many more nation states, we already have 200 states. I mean, we would have, what, 500, 1,000 states by the end of the 21st century? I mean, who knows? Uh, it would be a very different international order, and that needs some thought too. Final question. If uh, King Charles reigns for something like, or something not necessarily as long as his mother, but to the same age as his mother, that would be 20, 25 years from now, uh, will he um, be monarch of uh, a United Kingdom that has the same geographic boundaries uh, as it did at the moment of his coronation? Well, I, I, the best bet that they are, you know, as uh, as wide as they currently are, uh, would be, I think, to uh, a, a adopt a federal settlement. Because I think in the next 10 or 15 years, th there will be another referendum in Scotland. Uh, we have to face this and we have a challenge of how we involve all the citizens of the United Kingdom, not just those in Scotland. And I think we need to prepare the ground for a decision on should the UK continue and all the UK citizens should be part of that and, and should it continue with a reformed, essentially federal constitution. That's my vision. If part of the state says no to that, if they say they don't want it in Scotland, then you would move to that they'd have a second referendum on independence. But it seems odd to me that the first proposition is abolishing the state rather than the first proposition being should the state continue. And I believe it should continue as a federal uh, uh, federal state. And, and that's now what we should work for and put before the people. Um, and, and that way, I think uh, I, a new unity could reign over the kingdom that, uh, 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 that, that, that Charles passes on to his heirs. Well, thank you very much indeed. Just, just finally, a slightly teasing remark. Um, uh, you didn't talk about Northern Ireland in, in the, the, your last um, response. Um, do you regard that uh, as being uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the answer that you've given, or is it a, a special case? I think it, 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 it is a sp generally special case, because the, the constitutional position in Northern Ireland is still... Um, it's it, it still part, really, of, of what happened when um, the, 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 the south of Ireland left the United Kingdom. And uh, I, obviously, it, it was envisaged that you, Ireland would be, you know, a single unit in, in the Edwardian time. Um, and, and then partition came along. And, and so I, I think it is possible that uh, you would see... Um, you know, Northern Ireland deciding if, you know, a good portion of unionists wanted it, um, you know, to, to, to see their constitutional future in some form of united Ireland, presumably with, you know, uh, quite formal links between uh, um, the United Kingdom and Ireland being forged in some sort of, you know, perhaps new style of confederation, good goodness knows what, you know, might be thought of. We're but federal, I think that's we're separate Ireland. because Northern Ireland wouldn't be seceding as such, would it? It it because it clearly has two options. It's mm. either part of the United Kingdom or it's part of Ireland. I don't think anyone envisages a independent Northern Ireland state. So I don't put it in the same category as Scotland or even possibly Wales in the future. Yeah. Well, a federal Ireland might be the, the outcome of Irish unification and possible. trust in, in has always got to be in favour of that. So a very, very rich and um, stimulating discussion. Thank you very much indeed. I recommend My people pleasure, to read the, the essay, which is, is developed some of these points. And um, uh, I hope we'll have the opportunity to discuss these matters further, David. David, thank you very much. Thank you.